Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas Clements, and I refer to myself as a doctor of decay. I'm a paleontologist who specializes in trying to understand how animals become fossils. And I'm currently based at FAU, which is a university in Germany. Hello, I'm Dr. Bethany Allen. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich, and I'm interested in researching how and why biodiversity has changed over geological timescales. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Farid. I'm a taphonomist uh, based in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, and I focus mainly on fossil preservation from the early Paleozoic, the Cambrian and the Ordovician. My name is Orla. I'm from Dublin in Ireland, and I am a taphonomist, and I'm currently working at the State Natural History Museum in Stuttgart in Germany. A fossil is the remains or traces of ancient animals or plants. These can be physical fossils, such as the skeleton of a dinosaur, or maybe the shell of an extinct marine animal. And we call these body fossils. But they can also be the traces of animals, like footprints or even fossil poo. And we call these trace fossils. Usually a fossil is preserved over geological time, so over billions of years, so giving, giving us snapshots of uh, the past. And uh, there are different types uh, of uh, fossils. Uh, organisms can be preserved in amber, uh, in ice, and of course in uh, sediments. One of the most famous that you might have heard of is amber, which is actually the resin of ancient trees that has become fossilized. So in the past, animals like insects and lizards may have lived on these ancient trees and become trapped in resin. Over the time, the resin fell to the forest floor and eventually got buried, and that hardened into what we call amber. You might have also heard of other ancient animals, such as woolly mammoths, that were frozen in the permafrost in places like Siberia. In these situations, they're not true fossils, the extreme cold that was around when this animal died has slowed down decay. But these animals haven't turned into stone, so when the ice melts, the animal's body will eventually start to decay again until it is eventually destroyed. To set the scene, the most important thing to think about here is that 99.999% of all animals um, and life that's living on the planet will never become a fossil, which means there are many, many things and processes that will stop those animals and, the, and this life becoming a fossil. So in order for an animal to become a fossil, the first step is after dying, it needs to not be eaten. So for animals with hard parts like bones or shells, this is much more easy than for animals which only have soft body parts, for example, worms. Scavengers, bacteria and fungi will start recycling the dead animal immediately as soon as it dies. And they're really efficient at breaking down an animal's body. This is why when you walk down the street, you don't have to walk through a sea of dead earthworms, birds and squirrels. In order for an animal to actually become a fossil, we need a series of processes to happen which can slow down the processes of decay. Normally, the first step is the animal being buried. If the animal dies in an environment like a muddy river, or perhaps where the river meets the sea in like an estuary, or in some places at the bottom of the ocean, these dead animals can become quickly buried by mud and other sediments. And this actually stops scavengers from being able to eat the carcass. The interesting thing is that when you actually bury an animal, the decay doesn't stop. Bacteria will strip off all the fleshy bits first, like eyeballs, internal organs, and skin, until there's basically nothing left but bones. As this happens, the skeletons normally get buried deeper and deeper, and this creates more pressure from the overburden, which is the sediment, and this basically squishes the bones. Eventually, the high pressure can cause the sediment to turn into stone, and when this happens, the buildup of pressure causes water to be forced from the rock into the bones. When you increase the pressure on water, it actually increases its temperature, so it can become very, very hot. And this means it can actually start to dissolve the rock around it and absorb minerals. When this mineral-rich water moves through the bones, the minerals can actually start to grow inside the bones. And if this process continues, eventually the bones will become fully replaced by the minerals. And this leads to a fossil skeleton. It 
may come as a shock, but all parts of you can become fossilized. But the potential for fossilization and preservation are very vastly different from one another, depending on the part of the body that you're talking about. So when we think about fossils to begin with, I'm sure we all immediately think of bones and shelly material, right? And that makes sense because these are the hard parts of an animal. So these parts are far more robust to a lot of different processes that allow those parts to be fossilized. So things like the bones, the teeth, and for some animals, their external shells. These parts resist decay for the longest, so they're much more likely to become fossilized. However, in some very, very rare environments, animals die and are buried very quickly. For example, in maybe an underwater landslide or by volcanic ash during an eruption. In these special environments, decay can be slowed right down by a combination of factors, like being very, very cold. If this happens, then minerals can actually start to grow on the soft tissues of the animals, like their internal organs, and eventually will replace them. These fossils are exceedingly rare, but they're really, really important for paleontologists because they can tell us much more about the ancient animal than just the bones. For example, scientists have discovered fossil dinosaurs that are about 130 million years old in China that were killed by volcanic eruptions. The minerals from the volcanic ash actually allowed the soft tissues of the dinosaurs to be preserved. So we found fossil skin, internal organs, and even the feathers that were so well preserved we can work out what color they were by comparing them to modern bird feathers. Ultimately, the fossil record it is a book with many missing chapters. There are certain deposits from environments that are much more likely to preserve. You're much more likely to find fossils in an environment that had very rapid burial, like at the bottom of the sea or in an estuary, than you are in uh, maybe in a woodland or in a desert. While earth processes are fundamental in actually turning the bodies of animals and plants into fossils, earth processes can also result in the destruction of fossils by subjecting uh, these fossils to too much pressure or heat or by pulling them down into the earth's mantle where the rock gets melted. Because of this, the rock that we have at the surface does not evenly reflect geological time. We have a lot more fossils from more recent times and a lot fewer fossils from much older in the geological record. And this really skews our picture of uh, the fossil record that we have and how we see life has evolved. There are also many human factors that affect the fossil record as we have it today. So for example, it is much easier for scientists to go and find fossils just outside of a city than it might be in the deepest jungle or the remote Arctic. There are also factors like war and politics that make it harder for scientists to find fossils in certain places. And there are also inequalities in the amount of money available to scientists to go and find fossils in different countries around the world. So this is also a, a, another very hard uh, question uh, to answer. I think it really depends on what type of fossilization you're uh, looking at. So uh, for in some cases, traces or the trace left by organisms can be uh, fossilized more than the organisms that, uh, themselves. You have sometimes in certain outcrops more microfossils than macrofossils. In others, you have uh, way more bones and shells than uh, soft tissues. Uh, in general, I would say that the soft tissues are the rarest to, uh, to preserve. Uh, however, finding a fossil might be not that rare. It's a, it's, a common, it's a common thing to find a fossil. If you're walking and wandering in nature, you'll find a fossil of some sort. However, it really depends on what you're looking uh, for and where you're looking uh, for this. It might be for some things, finding some stuff might be rarer than others. You have to look at it in different ways. Fossils are not rare if you know where to look. So for instance, there are places on the south coast of the United Kingdom, like Lyme Regis, where you can find millions and millions of fossils. <laughs> I don't know if you could find millions and millions of fossils, but there are lots of fossils that you can find. Um, but generally speaking, if you think about the entirety of geological history, and if you think about the entire age of the planet, fossils are only found in very, very few sites 
And generally speaking, of all of the billions and billions and billions of animals that have ever li lived, very, very few of them will actually die and then be in the right environmental conditions to eventually turn into fossils. So I would argue that fossils are actually very rare. So I would say it's very hard to become a fossil and that's why they're so cool to study because every single one of them had their own unique pathway to becoming fossilized.